Hello and welcome to this discussion about making suicide awareness and prevention a workplace priority in partnership with Baton of Hope. I'm Jane Robertson from Frog Systems, the employee wellbeing platform provider, and for the next hour we'll be helping to break down the stigma around this topic and give you practical advice to use in your workplaces. I'm joined by three distinguished guests, Mike McCarthy, who co-founded the Baton of Hope, the biggest suicide prevention initiative the UK has ever seen following the loss of his son, Ross. Hi, Mike. Rory O'Connor, Professor of Health Psychology and leader of the Suicidal Behaviour Research Lab at the University of Glasgow and President of the International Association for Suicide Prevention. Hi, Rory. And Liz Skeet, Executive Director of Operations at the charity Samaritans. Hello. Welcome, Liz. If you have any questions uh, during our discussion, please do pop them into the comments and we'll do our best to answer them either during or at the end of our conversation. Um, Mike, perhaps I could start with you. Your son, Ross, uh, is the inspiration for Baton of Hope after leaving behind a message urging you to campaign for better mental health support. Can you tell us what Ross went through and what you want to achieve in his memory? Yes, thanks, Jane. Um, Ross was uh, a beautiful son, uh, the best son that a dad could wish for. And um, he was a happy boy, uh, but grew up to develop anxiety and depression in his teenage years, uh, which seemed to get, get worse. Uh, he struggled with it for over 10 years, but was a a trooper, a real kind of warrior, tried everything within his power to reach salvation, but um, eventually uh, he did succumb and uh, took his life on the 21st of February uh, 2021. And as you say, left a long letter, 12 pages, uh, addressing each member of his family and asking if we would fight for better mental health support. Uh, he said, the support is just not there. What he meant by that was that having suffered for 10 years, uh, he went to ask for therapy uh, from the uh, National Health Service and was put on a six month waiting list. And uh, he died two weeks into the wait. Um, when I eventually got back on my feet, um, my, my background is as a journalist, I've worked for 40 years in journalism. Uh, I started to do research into why this had never crossed my radar. You know, as a journalist, I'd covered wars and uh, crime and all kinds of societal issues, uh, terrorist atrocities, you name it. But the subject of suicide had rarely crossed my radar. And I felt a bit guilty about that as a, as a journalist. I wanted to find out why it was that this huge societal catastrophe uh, wasn't being talked about or reported by the media or discussed in parliament where was the public discourse etc etc as cut a long story short i met with a, another bereaved dad steve philip incredible guy who lost his son jordan to suicide and uh, we got talking about what little bit we could do as, as bereaved dads and uh, we came to the idea that you know that despite the complexities surrounding suicide that there was one thing that united everyone who took their own lives and that was the loss of hope and uh, from that came the creation of an actual baton of hope uh, designed and, and manufactured by goldsmiths and silversmiths to the royal family thomas light no less and um, yeah it's kind of taken off from there really and did Ross get any support? Was he working? Because um, he was what in his early 30s, I, I think, Mike, is that right? So did, did he try and get any support from his workplace? Or was it the sort of thing that you were just trying to deal with as a family uh, yourselves? He was an industrial electrician uh, working in the northeast of England and I think working in quite a macho environment where, you know, discussions among men about their emotional well-being are very, very rare in, in, in some places, perhaps getting a little uh, better. We talked about it openly as, as a family. We knew full well. We lived the experience with him to uh, some degree for, for 10 years. And um, he 
as I said, you know, he tried everything. He'd been to the GP. He'd been uh, in the sort of, uh, you know, the revolving doors. He tried to take his own life the year before, ended up in hospital, was discharged, had a crisis team come out, was referred back to the GP. And so it went on and on. Um, and I discovered that, you know, Ross was just one man, we're just one family, but this is, you know, widespread. And I, I know this sort of figure is used a lot these days, but I make no apology for repeating it, that, that suicide is the biggest killer of young adults under 35 in this country, not COVID, not cancer, not war, not drugs, not road accidents, it's suicide. Um, so yeah, the help was there to uh, a degree, but I found out that, you know, come the moment of, of crisis, there was very little support. And this is a story that I've heard over and over and over again. Uh, not just for the, the person who is suicidal, but then when a person has taken their own life to the families, very, very little support uh, we we discovered. Some great, hardworking, decent, underpaid, overworked people out there who are doing the very best they can, but they're not supported. They don't have the resources, and it's a crime chain. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, Mike. And um, it must be really hard having to retell this story over and over again. So really appreciate it. R Rory, obviously, this is a subject area that you're very close to and have been working on for, for, for decades. Um, in terms of what Mike has said about that lack of support and particularly that workplace piece, have you, you know, what are the facts about suicide in the workplace? Have you uncovered anything through the years that you've been working here that, could help people on this call today to understand what the kind of risks are, what type of people in the workplace are, are at particular risk if, if there is a, a specific type of person who, who maybe um, is more susceptible, I don't know. Well, there's a lot, a lot in that, a lot in that, Jane. Um, let me begin though just by um, thanking Mike and I know there are lots of people behind Mike um, organizing the battle on of hope and um and it's just amazing to see the momentum it's generated and is uh, in such a short period so like um sincere thanks from the sort of suicide prevention community for what you continue to do um in terms of so there's a lots of different things to really tackle there jane i suppose the if we start with the thing about what mike just highlighted there in terms of um People who are struggling with their mental health, people who are in the system, so to speak. I think one of the key challenges and things we, we haven't got right yet are what we would describe as continuity of care. And that so when somebody is, so somebody, for example, who is suicidal, what are the pathways? So I'll, I'll get into the workplace in a second, but what are the pathways to care and support? And and the sad reality is that we just don't have a consistent response to people who are suicidal across the UK. It's very dependent on where you live. And and also it's dependent on, um, well, a whole range of factors. One being that yeah, there may be pathways out there, but there are waiting lists, there are huge waiting lists. And the thing is that suicide doesn't, or suicidal thoughts don't wait for anybody. And, and the challenge we have is we have to have a system in place that people get the help and support that they need, not next week, not next month, next year, now they need it now and, and i think that although if i reflect on the last 20 years in the last 20 20 years mental health has certainly got more prioritization but we're still nowhere anywhere near being on an equal par with physical health conditions and so there's lots of different ways in which we can talk about the scale of the challenge of suicide prevention so mike cited one statistic we can also talk about the fact that 703,000 people die by suicide globally each year. We can also say that one in 100 deaths globally is by suicide. And so when you think about it on those levels, like this should be one of the top priorities in government, and it's not. And actually, with one political point, I was really disappointed earlier in the year to discover that the, the UK government or the Westminster government cancelled, did not go ahead with the 10-year mental health strategy. And yes, with mental health as one of the big conditions in terms of their new approach to tackling health, but it, does, it seems to me that that's a deprioritization. So I would urge anybody in this call today 
please speak to your local representative, speak to your MP. If you're elsewhere in the UK, your MSP, your local representative in Northern Ireland or in Wales, we need to keep banging the drum that suicide is preventable, suicide, suicide prevention needs to be prioritised, and that every one of us, but including leadership from government, needs to prioritise suicide and suicide prevention. So then if I move on to the workplace focus for a second, workplace has a huge, there's a huge opportunity for suicide prevention in the workplace. So although there's a strong relationship between people being unemployed and dying by suicide, that's an established suicide risk factor. But actually, if you look at the statistics, it's, it's more complicated. Because although, the, the, yes, people who are out of work are increased risk of suicide, the reality is that most people who die by suicide are in employment. They're working. And given that many of us spend most of our lives in the workplace or with colleagues in the workplace, it's a really important area for intervention and support. And again, what's been really positive over the last number of years has been a growing interest in workplaces trying to get involved in suicide prevention. But what that takes, once again, is leadership from the top of an organization. We need, we need champions, basically role models who are willing to talk about their mental health and organizations which are more agile but agile and, and tailoring the needs to the workforce there and then. And then I'll just, I'll say one other thing about who's at risk, uh, and, and then we can maybe uh, widen the discussion, I suppose. But for me, the, when we think about suicide and suicide prevention, yes, suicide is most commonly men. So three quarters of all suicides in the UK are by men. And as Mike said, people, both men and women under the age of 35, suicide is the leading cause of death. But, but having said that, any one of us is vulnerable to suicide. And suicide, there's no face of somebody who's suicidal. This idea of somebody with their head in their hands, that's an outdated, outmoded characterization. Of course, some, of those, some people will look like that, but most people won't. And so for me, the work that I've been doing for the last 20 years is trying to understand the psychology in particular of people who are suicidal. And for me, if we're trying to understand suicide risk, of course, we need to treat mental health problems. But we need to look beyond the treatment of mental health problems. Suicide and suicide prevention is a public health concern. And people become suicidal when they feel defeated and or humiliated from which they cannot escape. And it's that sense of entrapment, which is a driver to the emergence of suicidal thoughts. So then the question I would Back, back to governments, to organizations, to schools, to all of us, is what are we doing that is alleviating or reducing the likelihood that somebody feels defeated or humiliated or feels trapped? Because the stark reality is for too often, systems, societies, organizations are making it more likely that people feel trapped and defeated and humiliated rather than the opposite. Thanks, Rory. Um, and we'll come back to some of those, some of some of that uh, in much more depth. I want, just want to bring Liz in. Um, Liz, the Samaritans, obviously, you sort of take calls for people that maybe are at that stage where they are feeling defeated, humiliated. What are you seeing at the moment? And, and, and can you also tell us a, lot, a little bit about the work that you're doing in workplaces? Because you've done quite a lot of work in, in different sectors as well, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. Thank you. And I've been nodding throughout both those <laughs> conversations because it, you know, we understand all of that. And I should say as well as being here as um, Director of Operations, prior to joining Samaritans in a work situation, I was a listening volunteer and I still am a listening volunteer. And I'm just thinking through the sorts of calls I took on the duty last night, which reflected all those mental health gaps, uh, those feelings of despair and hopelessness. And people feeling utterly isolated with nobody to, to contact them um, and support them. Um, so, you know, Samaritans takes around 9,000, you know, contacts a day from people seeking emotional support. Not all are at the point of suicidal thinking, but, you know, a fair number are. And, um, and some are absolutely at that crisis point. We've certainly been noticing an uplift, and um, people won't be surprised by this, about the number of calls coming through daily basis around the cost of living pressures, financial concerns, and often these are people that are working. Um, so it's people who perhaps have not been in this situation before and they're needing to adapt to additional pressures. 
and the sorts of things that they convey are feelings of you know guilt shame embarrassment it's difficult for people to talk about these things particularly they look around and think well at least I've got a job other people must be worse off for me so there is something as well I think in that workplace setting of checking in being really overtly mindful about not making assumptions about somebody's situation and keeping sort of communication channels open I mean I think for us the last few months we've been taking around 400 calls a day that have had that sort of theme around out of about 9,000 a day so that gives you a sort of reflection really um, I think it's interesting as well because of course many workplaces are now hybrid or a blended model or there are people including quite often people relatively junior in their career who are working in an isolated situation at home so for all the good practice that has been developing around mental health and well-being in the workplace there is an additional challenge now people can hide how they're truly feeling through a screen um, and they can put their best foot forward um, and there are not those spontaneous opportunities in the way perhaps there used to be to sort of notice somebody's behaviour and how that's changing over time and um, something that managers might ordinarily be very tuned into. Um, Samaritans has done um, a number of different things to support employers across a whole range of workplaces, private, public health, etc. Uh, so we have um, training programs, for example, there's the Samaritans Training and Engagement Program, where we offer training to people managers in particular, built on our core listening uh, skills model. Samaritans doesn't offer clinical or health professionals, but we train our volunteers really, really well to make sure that they listen, uh, they reflect back what they're hearing, they ask open questions to help somebody understand what is really going on for them. Um, and to be able to recognise perhaps some next steps that they need to take, some options they can take to reduce that, that feeling of crisis and hopelessness. So we know that works on a large scale and has been for sort of 70 years and we've condensed that into specific training for workplaces. Um, we've also had a very um, robust and ongoing, really closely embedded partnership with Network Rail. Um, and some of this is preventative and supportive ahead of an incident happening. So really providing different types of training for frontline staff, um, people managers, as well as those frontline at stations. So they can be observant. Uh, they can understand how to spot the signs that someone's behavior might say something about, something a bit odd, just not quite right. Feeling confident to go and say, you know, how are you doing? Do you, do you want to know where, where, where you can get a coffee? Do, do you know anything that's actually um, not too exposing for them, but just sort of what we would call small talk. And we have a campaign called Small Talk Saves Lives. It's giving confidence, though, to do that in a very natural, gentle way. Um, and then hopefully to distract somebody from that specific point that they have to engage in a conversation, which perhaps takes them away from the severity of what they were thinking at that time. We also offer support after an incident at stations, a specific um, trauma related training, um, as well as volunteers can come into uh, a station perhaps shortly after in the days after an incident has happened and be around for staff for passengers who might just want to talk and reflect on what's happened. So a whole range of things. Thanks. Thanks for that, Liz. And Mike, what, one thing there and, and one point that um, Ruthie Austin, who, who's listening in, has, has, has made in the comments so far is, you know, got a very supportive workplace. So, you know, maybe they've done work like, like you've talked about there, uh, Liz, at the Samaritans. But there's a fear often of, of addressing the subject directly. And I know we did a recent report which which uh, we surveyed sort of 3,000 people, including 2,000 employees. And I think 1% of them said they would go to a line manager or colleague at work to tell them if they were feeling low uh, and they were struggling. And that's that's the big problem, isn't there? You know, how do you get people in a workplace situation to tell you that something's not quite right? I think, you know, Rory alluded to this, that the change has to come from the top. It has to be a cultural change. You know, managers, chief executives, HR leaders have to show that they have genuinely bought in uh, to, to all of this. Um, you know, our working environments play a crucial part in, in an in individual's mental health. And although mental health and well-being charters, I think, have improved considerably, it seems to me anyway, over the past 10 years, rarely do they include um, guidance specific to suicide awareness, support and prevention. And I think, you know, a lot of it is fear. I've spoken to a lot of business leaders over the past two years uh, since we lost 
uh, Ross. And what I hear very often is that, yeah, it's just too complicated, though, isn't it? You know, physical health, it's very easy to read. And, you know, mental health, it's just so complex, so complex. Well, of course, it is. There, there is some truth in that. But, you know, I run a few peer to peer support groups for men. And it's incredible, you know, how much information you can elicit by saying, how are you out of 10 and why? You know, it's as simple as that. I, I'm not sort of pretending that, you know, the issues around suicide are, um, are are in themselves simple, but it's not too difficult, actually, to get information from uh, employees. You can do this in, uh, anonymously in a, in a questionnaire to gauge, you know, the, the uh, mental well-being. So um, I think there's so many things that we can do in the workplace. You know, does your... Um, organization have a, a culture that promotes openness and a sense of safety to talk about mental health and, and, and suicide? Do your employees know how to notice the signs of someone feeling depressed or having suicidal thoughts? Um, do you, you know, do you know, your employees know where to go uh, if they're concerned about someone who may be having suicidal thoughts? All of all of those questions and, you know, what, what keeps um keeps the baton of hope it's a kind of fuel that 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 drives our engine in a way is to when people like rory uh, and and it seems to me that the vast majority of experts in the field say fairly unequivocally suicide is preventable so the question from baton of hope is why aren't we preventing them because you know uh, for all the great great work that that's being done those figures have fairly stagnated for 15 years or more and I think we've got to ask ourselves why do we need a change of approach perhaps are there things that we can uh, improve um, but that's you know we're, we're hoping that that employers will um, take this as seriously as they take physical well-being in, in, in the workplace and help us to break the stagnation around those suicide figures. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mike. And uh, uh, some of your colleagues at Talk Club are, have tuned in to listen to this today and doing great work. So uh, welcome to the conversation, guys. And thank you for listening in. Um, quite a few people raising uh, the issue of mental health first aiders, Rory. And, and this is something that a lot of businesses are doing now. They're training people up, they're training managers to be able to kind of have these conversations in the workplace. But that's quite a big responsibility, isn't it, on an individual in a workplace? So is that the solution or do workplaces need to be thinking more generally about this culture from the top and having an openness that, um, you know, that doesn't leave leave that on the shoulders of individuals in the workplace? Um, thanks, Jane. I'll come back to that in a second. But no. I, I'll just, I want to just address um, the question Ruthie, I think it was Ruthie asked, um, and Mike mentioned about the... Uh, one of the challenges is in the workplace, people are frightened to ask these yeah. questions. And it's just, so part of it is you have to challenge the myths around suicide. So it's really important to recognize that there's no evidence at all that you asking somebody else whether they're suicidal plants the idea in their head. Quite the opposite. There's evidence showing that if you ask that question, then the person is has, there's research showing that they're more likely to get the help and support that they need. So it's not about, so it's not saying that suicide prevention is simply all about just asking that question, but it's an important start, an important part of the puzzle. And of course, if you're sitting watching this and going, I would be, I'm petrified about asking that question. Well, that's understandable. I, I totally get it. The first time I ever asked that question, I was really frightened that the, that the person would come back and say, yes, I am thinking of suicide. And so, so it's really important then to, to support people in, in doing that. And my advice would be, as long as, so in my experience over many, many years of asking that question many times myself, as well as, as well as hearing other people asking that question and knowing the research evidence is, as long as you respond with compassion, you're non-judgmental, you don't try and minimize what's going on for that person, just acknowledge, just validate their feelings. So, that, so that by validating their feelings, we're simply just mean, just saying to somebody else, that must be really difficult for you. And so it's not about you trying to solve the person's problems, but it's just been a sounding board and that idea of then once that conversation is opened up, it's them working together to go, actually, 
where do we need to go for support? Is there somebody, is it, is it in, the, in the work context? Is there an occupational health person? Or is it your GP or is it somebody else? And, or, or some other mental health professional. So just to really encourage somebody, if you are concerned about somebody, please ask them. And again, I know for certain that in the, literally nine times out of 10, if you ask that question, the person who's asked it will often feel a sense of relief because there's off, too often there's a shame associated with suicidal thoughts. And Liz made the point about often people who maybe are in, their, in a job go, well, actually, I should be really lucky. I've got a job. And, and so, you, so there's often a shame of well, why should I feel suicidal? And what none of us ever know is what's going on in the mind of somebody who's suicidal. It's complex. There's never one factor that leads to suicide. But opening up that conversation is really, really important. And, it, and during COVID, I wrote a book trying to summarize the last 25 years of my work on suicide. But I also included in that my own personal reflections and also the countless people I've met on my journey. And, and, and I include lots of examples of people actually, even small acts of kindness, small acts of reaching out. Some artists, as Liz talked about, of the Small Talks Save Lives campaign, which I mentioned in the book. But also, but I met so many people who, we, when, when, they're, when somebody who's in an acute suicidal crisis, that's somebody just actually interrupting those suicidal thoughts, disrupting those suicidal thoughts, saved their life. And because what we know about suicidal thoughts is they, they come in waves of intensity. And so what you're trying to do then is have a situation, have an environment, if it's a workplace co context or more broadly, so when somebody is feeling suicidal, that we can keep them safe in that moment of crisis when the thoughts are escalating. And that's, and again, so even small things, we just say checking in with somebody, asking are they, how they're doing, ask or smiling, Space, anything which promotes a sense of connection or a sense of I'm a real person. Because too often with a person who's suicidal feels worthless, especially in that moment of crisis. So anything we can do in the workplace can, that can promote that is so important. And then the last bit, sorry, Jane, go back to your first bit of that question, is, and, and, and we've, I think we've made this point, Mike and I now, about it has to start from the top. We need to, and all the examples I know of really of workplaces where we have successfully changed cultures, embedded mental health. There's been a senior partner or a senior member of that organization has talked about their own mental health and has, and has really led by example. Part of it, of course, is having mental health first aiders, but that's not the only way of doing it. There's just different ways of doing it. That's certainly one of them. I think that staff should be, we should have in the same way that we have a physical first aid person exactly as I think Jane's made in the chat. We need to do that as well for mental health, of course. But that's only one solution. It's basically making sure we have a, a, a safe environment, as Mike said, so people feel comfortable, secure, that they can confidentially disclose information which will not adversely affect their job prospects and will not adversely affect any other aspect of their life. And actually, that 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 point that you just made there, Rory, about it not affecting their work life is understanding so that the employer is understanding that they are in some kind of difficulty, but not suddenly taking drastic action to, I don't know, alter their their working pattern. I mean, you know, if somebody does say that to you as an as an employer, as a, as a manager in the workplace, that they are feeling suicidal or they're really struggling you know, can, you know, do you, do you alter their working pattern to try and make, make, make life a bit easier for them at work? I, I mean, how does, how do, how do you approach that? I mean, if, if I can answer that, I mean, there's, there's obviously an approach around reasonable adjustments so it could be considered for an individual. I think it's around thinking like any people manager does, what can I do to enable this individual, this unique person to perform at their very best? in their role and to thrive in that role. And, and the adjustments or the environment that they're in or what they need might be really different to help them play to their strengths. And I would say that usual approach can be applied to someone who is really struggling with their mental health, including having suicidal thoughts, including perhaps um, having disclosed that they have made a suicide attempt. I think the key thing is that managers are properly trained equipped, supported themselves by a wider group so that they don't find those conversations so stressful or shocking. 
that that isn't conveyed in their response. So they need to be calm, as Rory said, non-judgmental, not making assumptions and showing that it's absolutely OK to have this conversation um, and to know it's OK not to have a solution, but to know that I want to support this person. You know, it's a very humanising thing for somebody to be able to say, perhaps especially for the first time, this is how I feel and somebody not to be really shocked and worried and to perhaps, go, you know, go over the top in terms of more formal actions. Sometimes they just need to know somebody has heard that and they're still standing <laughs> sort of thing. So um, th there's something around, again, it's all from that cultural piece, trying to be really consistent showing at every level in the organisation that we're all human beings. These are good things to talk about. Everybody will hit bumps in the road. And I think also recognising that however capable an employee might present themselves, we don't know what's in their history, whether it's way back from childhood, whether it's something more recent, and what things might for them make them particularly susceptible. You know, there may be a history of abuse or other sort of trauma, which a manager won't necessarily know about. But we need to be thinking really broadly um, about all these things could be getting into the mix for that person. And they may choose not to disclose that, but I think it's just staying very open minded. What practical steps can we do to help? And trying to do that in partnership with the individual so they don't feel a greater sense of loss of control. And that builds trust. Hopefully that builds more momentum and more conversations. Thank you. Lisa. Can I just jump in, Jane? Uh, and say yeah, absolutely. One thing that, you know, uh, we found is, um, you know, interesting to consider is, you know, if you are an employer, if you're a business leader or, or whatever, head of an organisation, ask yourself the question, you know, if one of my employees needed time off uh, for mental illness, such as depression or anxiety, would they tell the truth? Do you think that they would tell the truth? If the answer is yes, well, congratulations. But I think in most cases, my, my guess is, and I don't know this for sure, there have been surveys about this suggesting that, you know, very few people would tell the truth. But my guess is that, you know, that that, that is true, that, that people, and, uh, you know, I'm retired now, but uh, if I was still at work and I needed time off, uh, through depression, even I, you know, having learned what I've learned over the past two years, might struggle to tell uh, my employer that actually I'm depressed. And given the language that we use, and this is one, well, for all of us, but prime, you know, very importantly for the media, a conservative MP took time off work uh, a few months ago with depression. And one of the headlines was um, top MP admits. To admits, I, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, and when the, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, stood down, again, there were sort of similar headlines about her admitting to having struggled with her uh, mental well-being. Well, imagine turning that round, uh, you know, so that it's a physical illness and saying celebrity admits chest infection. It's, you know, we, we just wouldn't say it. Um, and again, I think, you know, if you consider that we haven't even got the language right at the moment, there's a, a, a still a really long way to go, I believe. Yeah. And by the comments that we're getting as well, there's lots of people here saying, look, they, you know, they've got what they think are good practices in their workplace now, but trying to get the wider message out in their local councils to their local MPs, they're sort of struggling. And and Rory, you you that's what you bang the drum about, really, isn't it? It's just not an individual workplace issue. It has to be something that we as a society are addressing and which is what exactly what Mike's trying to do with this campaign. Well, absolutely. And I think it is. It's, um, I mean, I, I just bring it back to the point about um, the Les made about reasonable adjustments is why should it be any different that if I present with mental health problems that I don't get the reasonable adjustments are not made in the same way if I have a physical health condition. And I, I mean, for that, it's as simple as that, right? In one level, obviously, it's com more complicated than that. But I mean, as a starter for 10, that should just be accepted. And, I, and many organizations, that is happening. But we still we, we still have a, a, a huge um, task ahead of us. But we have to change societal attitudes. So workplace is a microcosm of the society more generally. And I actually, what encourages me is, when I speak to my children, for example, about mental health, the way I can have a conversation with them is very different from what the conversations I ever had at that age. So I am more optimistic about um, that change in culture of really being much more open about having mental health challenges and struggles. 
and not and re and seeing reaching out as a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. And 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 but but although I'm I'm optimistic about that, I am concerned looking ahead that right, we're in the midst of a cost of living crisis in the UK, an extra 0.5 percent interest rate rise. Thus far, there's been no mitigations put in place, new mitigations put in place to protect the most vulnerable. Um, and I know there's a meeting going on this morning, I think, in, in Downing Street with the banks, right? So hopefully something will happen with that. But we need these, we need to recognize that the, these huge cultural impacts. COVID, although thankfully the suicide rates <clears throat> did not increase during COVID, our concern is there's lots of evidence. We, we monitored the mental health and well being of the UK population during COVID. There's clear evidence that mental health suffered. There's clear evidence that suicidal thoughts increased and some evidence that suicide attempts increased, in particular amongst young people. So my fear moving ahead is, yes, at this moment in time, suicide is a leading cause of death of middle-aged men. right? And that we need to do as much as we can to support those. But we need to also protect the next generation. And especially now dealing with the, the fallout of COVID, now the ongoing impact of the cost of living crisis and young people going, what are we doing about the climate as well? I mean, there's lots of stuff going on which makes people feel hopeless. And that's why we go back to Mike's point about the baton of hope. There's a whole generation have lost hope. It's not just a generational thing, but it's in particular the younger generation have lost hope. And of course, us who are slightly older, I mean, sometimes you do have to really think, what the heck is going on? More needs to be done. Hmm. And, and Liz, you know, young people coming into the workforce and especially over the last couple of years, it's been a very, very different workplace. You know, home, well, work bleeds into home life now. So it's very difficult to have a, a structure potentially at home sometimes as well, which is, again, adding to these problems. But is there a specific sort of message that you get out to employers for the younger people that are coming, you know, and starting out in work over the last few years, is there a different set of problems and priorities that they, they're, they're having to address there? Um, I think not necessarily in terms of the skills that we provide them with, because we do think those are core flexible skills that can be helpful for a whole range of individuals. But I think what employers do worry about is that particular piece and how can they build trusting relationships relatively quickly with someone who may feel less confident in the workplace already, learning to navigate around an environment like that in their first few years of work. Bearing in mind they've not necessarily had structure um, from school or university, for example, either, because they've been doing this you know, for quite some time. Um, so I think it is about being really mindful and I guess being overt about that checking in piece. And it, it does feed into that leading from the top because if someone who is seen in a position of authority, who could maybe be a bit intimidating to a younger person in their early years of a career, actually shows that they're really comfortable to talk about these things. They're not going to judge and they're going to be consistent rather than pay lip service to some of you know, some of the values the organisation may be talking about. But actually, they're really showing that in the workload decisions that they make in their support and their responsiveness, honest conversations. I think that is going to be more encouraging because... Um, obviously someone who's been in work for longer, maybe navigating all those difficulties, but, but at least have some experience to draw on about what happened last time and who to go to. For, for someone who's not really been in that workplace, it's, it can be really overwhelming. Um, and then, of course, if they're not having the regular contact, coming into the workplace could be becoming increasingly anxiety provoking for them and you get a bit of a vicious, a vicious cycle. So, yeah. And can I ask, just going back to the point about mental health first aiders, because obviously we know a lot of companies are now are now training people up to be mental health first aiders. Um, but, you know, the workplace has changed. So, may, you know, a lot of them maybe were trained to be in the office face to face and, and spotting the signs. Whereas obviously that's now, you know, like we are on a call today. It, it's much, much more difficult, as you've all said, to sort of point that out. Um you know, do, do those mental health first aiders themselves need be different training now? And do they need support themselves as well to have these, you know, much more open conversations and knowing where to go if somebody does tell them something that they then are worried about? I mean, with our, within our own organisation, we've got mental health first aiders and they have needed to adapt to offer that really overtly in a virtual session and be really thoughtful about how they run that virtual session. So it is 
inclusive, it is safe, making sure they are thinking about how people respond. Um, and it isn't the same, but they are, I guess, putting in that extra effort to try and create an atmosphere to encourage people to, to come forward. And Mike, you you go in you you go into your local um, football club, don't you? In Sheffield, I think you know to run sessions. You've been into lots of workplaces. Have you seen the bosses of those workplaces buy into this, or is there still a bit of a barrier there? I, I think there is a, a barrier, and I think that barrier is uh, you know what what Rory referred to as the as the fear factor that a lot of business leaders. Uh, because of the mythology that surrounds suicide and suicide prevention, uh, you know, try to um, fight shy of anything to do with addressing the, the, the subject of suicide and, and suicide prevention. I mean, one, one thing that I would say is that, you know, I, I think nobody can hold back the technological sort of um, advances, the, the, the tide of advances that we're, we're facing now as a, as a society. But I do think it's strange sometimes and a little bit ironic that you know people for example who um, are lonely uh, and look for help with with loneliness are referred to apps so in other words you know we're telling people who are alone and in despair go talk to your phone and and i think there's a real danger that we're stripping the humanity out of society baton of hope has been asked to endorse a number of of these apps and i'm not you know I, i'm not criticizing them per se technology definitely has a role to play but we've got to think about how we balance this you know remote working and virtual uh, sessions how we balance that and what effort we put into those people who are feeling increasingly isolated a lot of companies have recognized the fact that you know not having to pay for overheads uh, as, as they didn't have to during covid is really you know uh, economically beneficial but actually you know in the long term is it i think we've got to look at you know what we as human beings are, are, are meant to communicate we're, we're, we're meant to socialize we're meant to you know smile at each other occasionally we're, we're meant to put a shoulder a hand on the shoulder of a of a mate or send a text and just say you know how are you really or all of that kind of thing and as i say you know i'm not opposed to obviously to technology it's brought incredible advances for mental well-being as much as many other things but i think just on a very broad point, I think we've got to be really careful that that we don't further isolate people in a, an, an already sort of isolated position. Yeah, which comes back to your point, Rory, that you were making earlier, isn't it? Yeah, no, I was just going to agree entirely with Mike. We have to be really careful. And um, so obviously the growth in apps and the digital interventions i mean i welcome that in principle because if, if people who won't get any help are getting something that's obviously good news but the, but my concern is it's oh let's offer people the app instead of face to face which they might need and and actually one of the concerns during COVID was when we when we went very quickly to remote delivery is that there were people who maybe really really needed face to face and they didn't get it so so we need to be really careful that we recognize that everybody's needs are unique and we need to tailor our response. And can I just say something, on, there's a conversation going on in the chat about mindfulness yeah. in schools. And it's really important to re re remind ourselves that um, very recently in the last 12 months, the largest ever study of mindfulness in schools has been conducted and there's no evidence that it works in schools. So teachers like, teachers like it and there's um, some other positive benefits, but mindfulness should not be mandated in schools is, is would be the evidence yeah. um so just be very careful on that yes we have to make well-being and absolutely promote well-being absolutely start uh, we need a full lifespan approach but some people like mindfulness other people don't but the evidence doesn't support its use in schools just yet Rory can I just take you back into the workplace a little bit because I mean essentially what I guess what we're saying and what what we see in a lot of the conversations we, that we have at, at Frog is it's about knowing your people it's about knowing the people that you work alongside you know if you're a manager knowing the people in your team and not just knowing them on screen or you know in the office but knowing what's kind of happening in their lives you know having those chats that aren't just about work so, you know, if you if if you just see your workforce as a commodity who come in, do the job, 
help you make money, whatever it is, go home. That's just not work. That's just not the way life life should be working. You know, is, is that is that what you would sort of say to people on this call? Yeah, it's a, absolutely. It's just a case of treating somebody as another human being, and you're reaching out and connecting. And um, and like in other places, people talk about always ask twice, and I really agree with it. So Mike said about the the conversation starters, maybe about the one, how do you feel out of one to ten? Yeah, that's a great idea. But the other one is we're all very good at going, oh, how are you doing? And if somebody asks me that question, first of all, I'll probably say I'm fine. fine. So yeah. Asking twice. So you actually genuinely want to, you're conveying that you genuinely want to know the answer. And the other thing is just remind ourselves that if we're asking that difficult question, say about um, some of what's, if there's challenges going on in somebody's life. Again, if we, if we want, if we're still frightened about asking that question, we'll convey that in a subconscious level to the person to make it less likely that they'll actually open up. So it's just recognizing that we just need to be like um, Liz referred to the sort of motivational interviewing techniques and all but name in her one of her answers about we ask questions which are open. We're asking questions which when we're having a conversation, we summarize back. And so we're basically the non-judgmental, compassionate, just reaching out. But yeah, just check in. But, but it's finding that balance that you don't want to be prying into somebody's life, but just starting that conversation. So you build trust and you build some sort of connection. And Mike, you know, you're a journalist and uh, I'm an ex-journalist and you always have to try and ask open questions, don't you, to try and get an answer for somebody. If you just ask them a yes or no, they're just going to answer yes or no. So it's, it's as Rory and Liz have said, it's the, 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 the questions that you ask of somebody need to be very open and maybe not about, you know, what they might be struggling with, but um you know just hey you know what are you doing at the weekend how's the family kind of thing uh, and leads them into telling you maybe a little bit more than they would have done if you just said you know how are you i'm fine thank you very much yeah you know as i say at talk club we ask the question how are you out of 10 um but i often think that talk club is almost as much as a listening club as it is a talking club and and it's uh, as liz and, and rory <clears throat> excuse me we're saying earlier it's every all of us want to be val validated we all want to be heard um so it's just about listening to people and i think you know one of the the many regrets that i have <clears throat> after losing my son is that as a dad you know as a parent you instinctively want to fix somebody that's you know we must do this we've got to do that we'll take you to so and so we'll speak to so and so and i think you know if there's we we loved each other there's no doubt about that but i think if i made one mistake it was probably that i didn't listen um it enough uh, as much as i should and i would say that to anybody listening from whatever uh walk of life you know yeah it's as I say, it, it sounds a bit airy fairy, doesn't it? Sometimes, but smiling and and um, communicating with people is is shown scientifically to work. Um, and uh, and I always say that you know if you take nothing away from what I've said, you know, try to learn from from what's happened to to me, and um, don't just smile and talk, but but listen. Be prepared to to listen and hear what people are saying we've got to uh we're almost almost out of time sadly um so mike thank you so much and uh, you know uh, we're all i think in our every every moment of our lives trying to learn to listen a lot better than we do sometimes and, and especially now in the workplace as well but just to sort of sum up and i'll go around everybody but mike just to, to really just ask you a little bit more about the workplace charter um, you know, if uh, tell us a little bit, if you can, sort of summarise what what the workplace charter is going to do, and and if an organisation, if any of the people uh, here on the call today want to kind of sign their organisation up for it, what will they get by being part of that charter? Yeah, if you go onto our uh, website, you can see an introduction to the workplace charter. We hope that it will become a kind of kite marker, a symbol of best practice when it comes to suicide prevention in the workplace. Uh, I won't go through all the detail, but it's based on six principles and anyone who's interested can register their interest. We have a conference coming up 
uh, towards a zero suicide society in Sheffield in September, at which uh, Rory is uh, has kindly agreed to, to speak. And uh, we're inviting companies to physically come and sign the, the pledge, you know, um, and, and there's information there not just about the, the why is why we need to do this, but it's how. And it doesn't matter if you're a multinational conglomerate or a, a backstreet mechanic or whatever, you know, um, we, we understand that, that not everybody has the money to be able to provide uh, the, the the best of care. But there are so many things that you can do. And we will also be offering advice on how to implement uh, the uh, measures that that we've outlined on our on our website, and uh, if people want to come along to the conference in September um, and sign the pledge, uh, I'm sure to a round of applause. Then, you know, please register your interest. Yeah, um, Rory, what would you like to, to to sort of say to the people on the call today? Then to sort of take away with them, I suppose I've made this point already, but it's worth repeating. Um, if you are concerned about a colleague um, or a friend. Or family member, please reach out. Please ask how they're how they're doing. You're not going to do any harm, but it could save a life. So please, please reach out. Thank you. And Liz, so I think um, Mike summed up the power of listening really, really well. Thank you, Mike. It is such a simple thing to do, and actually, it doesn't come naturally to most of us, particularly as you move into managerial jobs or professional technical jobs where you feel you are meant to advise and coach and you know, offer solutions but actually we, we could all benefit from learning about that and applying it in different aspects of our role not just around concerns around mental health and suicide it makes a huge difference for someone to be heard and you equip them by the process of listening to help them realize what's going on to find some alternative solutions and to feel empowered that there are other options other than possibly the worst case scenario that they were thinking about so listen and have a conversation at work everybody um i know there have been lots of people exchanging really helpful information with each other in the comments so thank you so much for doing that as well um there will be a, a recording of this so we'll share that with you afterwards and please do share with any colleagues at work that you think might find it helpful um thank you so much again to mike and rory and liz for your company and for your incredible insight today um if you want to find out about the workplace charter go to battle on of hopeuk.org. You can find out all about Mike's campaign there and all about the charter if you want to get your workplace involved. And uh, if you want to find more about uh, employee wellbeing and what we do as a, as a company around that, please do visit our website, frogsystems.co.uk. But it's been a fascinating conversation, one that I know we'll come back to um, as time moves on. Um, but incredible work that all three of you are doing. Um, thank you again, uh, Liz, uh, Rory, and Mike. And thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in today. Um, I hope you can enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.